because a system is only going to do what you configure it and tell it to do, yeah. which means you have to have a strong process. So if you don't know, if you can't do the process um, or conduct the business manually and kind of walk through those steps, then a system is, is unlikely to help you. Conversations are at the heart of everything we do, but how do you turn a conversation into revenue? Welcome to B2B EQ, a podcast from Unifor. I'm your host, Tim Harris. Join me as I interview business leaders and market makers to learn how to move deals forward, scale best practices, and establish relationships that create value and grow revenue. Let's get started. All right. Welcome back to another episode of B2B EQ. Today's guest is a household name in RevOps community. She's dedicated to bolstering the skills of those in RevOps, a huge advocate for the role and for the position and, and the impact it plays in a revenue team, executive advisory council member for women in leadership, host of the Revenue Engine podcast. Make sure to listen to that <laughs> podcast right after this. Founder and Chief Revenue Operations Officer at the RevOps Collective, Rosalind Santa Elena. Rosalind, so good to see you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. It's great to be here Great and great to talk to you. Looking yeah, forward to it. so <laughs> I've gotten to follow you for, gosh, ever since <laughs> I got into the technology sales tech landscape, I think when you were first back at Clary and some of those other companies and you have always been an advocate for the role of revenue operations and and what that does for not just a sales organization but a full go to market team and as a marketer i've i've always seen that when you're working with sales and the connectivity between all of the systems and tools and processes rev ops sales ops enablement that is really the linchpin that holds all this together and the more I spend time in it, the more I feel like it's a competitive advantage. So <laughs> how did you first get started in this and and would love to just kind of get a little background for, for our listeners? Yeah, yeah. So definitely. So yeah, I've been in the ops space, I guess. It's been, let's see, I've been leading teams about 20, what are we in, 2023? So I guess about 20 years or so, a little over 20 years, um, way before it was called RevOps, way before we were cool and, <laughs> and people talked about us. I think ops started out, you know, people think it's new, but I was telling people, hey, as long as there has been a need for revenue, as long as there has been sales teams and marketing teams, there has been an operations function. Uh, I think in the past, it's been a lot more back office focused. Um, mm -hmm. Now has really come maybe five, the last maybe 10 years or so has really come to the forefront for many reasons that, you know, I'm happy to jump into and get on my soapbox all the time. But yeah, so I've been in, you know, I started out in really large companies, um, actually very, very early on started in finance, but moved over to the dark side of sales, as I say, on the ops side and have kind of built out my career, primarily started out in sales ops and then and then moved into what we called field operations, which was really marketing and sales, and then kind of this full mm -hmm. go to market operations. So you know, I've had experience in really end to end funnel, you know, from top of top of funnel prospect to customer, and then especially now in SaaS, this whole recurring model where customer success and sort of that journey after the first sale is done is so critical. Um, but in big companies, small companies, kind of seeing the good, the bad, and the ugly <laughs> of operations. Yeah. But as you mentioned, I do think, you know, I truly believe that it is a strategic, I would say strategic differentiator for businesses, you know, when it's done right, definitely. I, I, absolutely, when it's done right. It's kind of like plumbing, you know, when it's done <laughs> wrong, it ends up being a really big mess, yes. but when it's done right, it can make everything work seamlessly and flawlessly yeah. and and really helps all the stuff that that maybe your customer facing teams interact with on a daily basis it's it's interesting to see the role growing so much being the yeah. the number one growing role in b2b uh, businesses i think tech especially but now expanding quite a bit mm -hmm. for those listening that are going I have RevOps or I have sales ops or I have enablement or I have one of a thousand different titles that kind of fall into that mix. Mm -hmm. How do you define RevOps? How do you kind of define that role and what are some of the, the things that RevOps typically owns? Yeah, I think, um, you know, from my perspective, you know, revenue operations is really that that infrastructure that supports your end to end revenue process. Right. So I think about, you know, people process tech, right? Like most people think about data and insights, but also strategy and enablement. 
right? It's really those um, those major pillars that support the entire customer lifecycle. Um, you know, I mentioned sort of you know top of funnel to you know to prospect to customer. But you think about marketing and sales and customer success, but also services support implementation. Those are some of the teams that are in go to market that I look at RevOps as supporting from that. Um, infrastructure perspective, but also we work cross-functionally. You know, I would say nobody is safe from operations. We will touch your business mm -hmm. because we work with finance and with legal and, you know, with product, um, as well as with HR when it comes to compensation and, you know, headcount planning. And I think in earlier companies, you know, even working with engineering as well. So it's a very, very cross-functional role that is really mm -hmm. that um, more than a support function. Um, for the go-to-market team, but really an enabler and a driver to help the business be, you know, obviously more successful, but also be more efficient and be more optimized, which I think is what, you know, we're all looking for, especially in this market. It, that leads me right into something, which is, you know, we've all been talking about productivity this year. I think that's mm -hmm. been the trend. It's it's on every single ad of every uh, software. <laughs> hey, it will make you more productive, right? That yeah. is like the word. Uh, do more with less. Oh, here's the software that'll help you do it, but add yeah. more to it. <laughs> um, and, and so it, with that, and, and the fact that RevOps typically does own technology, like where are you seeing some opportunities for RevOps to make a big impact? I think of things like some of the tools that are coming available, um, AI being a big topic. How are you seeing RevOps play into that? And how's that changing the role of revenue operations a bit? Yeah, I think um, that's a great question because I think a lot of times when people think of RevOps, they think of tech stack, right? Mm -hmm. um, oftentimes when, hey, we need someone to manage our CRM, right? We need somebody to manage, you know, Salesforce or HubSpot or whatever tool that you're using. And they think, oh, we need a RevOps. And then they make kind of the mistake of just hiring RevOps for technology and not for all the other things that RevOps can actually bring to the business. Um, but in speaking specifically about technology, I think because, you know, that's probably one of the primary factors, though, for this sort of explosion of revenue operations is because our tech stack has exploded. I mean, there's literally, right, <laughs> literally not only a piece of technology for every single part of your business um, and every single part of the funnel, but multiple ones, right, dozens of them yes. to help you. So being able to select the right technology for your business um, to provide, you know, the right um, support for your needs, but also being able to manage that and administer it and continuously improve it and enable and train mm -hmm. the team to actually use it, you know, and drive adoption. That's a huge undertaking. And I think with revenue operations, we are primarily tasked with doing that, right? And in smaller organizations, we're the ones not only selecting the vendor, we're negotiating a contract, right? We're literally yeah. the person in the back end who is connecting the APIs and doing the actual work, which, you know, in a larger company, you have the benefit of having you know, an IT team or PMO team, you know, in larger companies I've worked at, we actually had a project management team, right, to actually support us versus when you're a small company, you kind of wear multiple hats and do all of that. Um, but in terms of technology, I think for RevOps, we have a huge play here because one, we're probably, if not the biggest um, target persona for these I was just going to say every to us. seller. <laughs> yes, yeah. every seller is listening to this going, how do I talk to RevOps? Because you're on my ICP like yeah. persona every time. Every yes. time. Yeah. And actually, that's interesting because I have a lot of conversations around how to sell to revenue yeah. operations. Um, but I also think that because we're it's such a broad role still, right, there are still people who in revenue operations are, who are more of the, um, you know, management kind of in the back background doing things. And then there's more of the the ones in the front end kind of leading strategy. Um but with technology, I mean, there's so much great tech out there, right? And everyone's like, oh, I have a, I have this problem, so I'm going to buy this piece of tech, right? I have a, you know, lead routing problem, so I'll buy this. I have a, you know, sales engagement problem, I'll buy this, right? And instead mm -hmm. of, you know, at the, at the heart of it is, you know, one of the things I tell people is to make sure you focus on your process, right? Because a system is only going to do what you configure it and tell it to do, yeah. which means you have to have a strong process. So if you don't know, if you can't do the process um, or conduct the business manually and kind of walk through those steps, then a system 
is, is unlikely to help you, right? Because the system is really brought in to help automate, make things faster, you know, uh, minimize manual steps, really help mm-hmm. to um, save your, hu- the human aspect, you know, you, you saving the human um, time, right? From having to do things. And so there's definitely a lots of great technology out there. Shiny new object mm-hmm. syndrome is a real thing for everybody. Um, but making sure that you're buying the right technology and having your RevOps, you know, involved because not only making sure you're buying the right technology to address the business challenges that you have and those use cases, but also make sure you have the process and the policies around that to support the tech to be successful and the adoption and the training and all the other things that need to happen. Mm-hmm. Um, and then making sure that it's going to integrate and play well with the technology that you have. Um, because I think we see a lot of that where people buy lots of tools and I call it the Frankenstack, right? Where they just kind of start building tools. <laughs> Yeah. And then you start to see when you actually come in and look at the, you know, technology overall, you realize that there's a lot of redundancies, right? And things that you can really save, you know, and that's a great way to be, you know, efficient and save some money too, is to really, Mm -hmm. you know, hone in on your technology stack and make sure that you have the right tech for the right reasons and you minimize redundancies. I I think that's a good call out as we see the platforms consolidate and we see all of these. And and I guess my question to you and not to call anyone vendor out, so we won't do that, but (laughs) we all know about the mega vendors that have like every single thing under them. And it's like, okay, one platform to rule them all, Mm -hmm. you know, bad Lord of Rings reference, but still. (laughs) (laughs) And then you have your best of breed. You have your point solutions. Yeah. That's a really tough dance when you're putting together that Frankenstack or that tech stack that we don't <laughs> want avoiding. to turn into the Frankenstack. Yeah. That's right. So so how do you when you look at it like I think of Legos, right? No one gives you the perfect box of Legos with all the right pieces. Like you're kind of grabbing some from this box and some from this one. Yeah. <laughs> RevOps is tasked to put it all together. How do you balance those two needs? What are some yeah. strategies? Yeah, definitely. So having a, this is something I'm really surprised a lot of people don't have is having a technology roadmap, right? Mm -hmm. Really understanding how, I mean, everything should be approached with a strategy, right? Everything that you're doing, there should be an end goal and there should be a strategy in terms of how you're going to get there. And so your tech Mm -hmm. stack is no different, right? Having an understanding well, this may be even challenging sometimes for a lot of companies, but having a current roadmap of just a mapping of all the technology that you actually use, right? I've had that situation where I've joined companies and it takes me, you know, 60 days just to figure out all of the different tools that people are using. Um, But -hmm. having a really a roadmap and an understanding of what tools you're using um, and just, you know, maybe from a practical perspective is really um, aligning that and mapping it out to the customer journey, right? You think about your end-to-end revenue process and being able to actually map technology to each part of that process and see what you're using the tech for, right? Just simply seeing, okay, what do I have? What am I using it for? Who's Mm -hmm. using it, right? And are we getting the value from that product? And then mapping that out. And then you can start to see the gaps, right? You can start to see one, either you have redundancies, which there you go, you can start to save yeah. money and consolidate, or you can see where the gaps are before you purchase, you know, or look for another technology to add to your tech stack, make sure that you know, very, very clear where that fits in, in your customer um, life cycle. But also, what are you going to do with the tech, right? What is that use case that you're solving for multiple use cases? Um, and how is how are you going to implement it? You, know, you should have a project plan around how it's implemented, how it's going to be, you know, rolled out, who's going to be using it, you know, kind of the whole um, details of who's going to be using it, how are they going to be using it, how are you going to be training them, and make sure that you have a, you Mm -hmm. know, good training and adoption uh, program as well. Otherwise, you can implement the best tools in the world, and there'll be a failure because no one's using it. That's The the adoption part is something that I feel has become top of mind for everybody right now. Yes. So for the the sellers out there, because I think this is always one of the challenges, you know, you're trying to get that consensus purchase. Mm-hmm. And one of the questions is always, okay, how, how do we drive adoption? And I was at a, a sales enablement conference and I loved what this um, person said. They said, the way I'm sold to is the way that I believe they're going to be in the adoption process to help and support me in adoption, right? Mm-hmm. So if the person was really consultative and a, and a trusted advisor in the sales process to me, mm-hmm. then they're probably going to be that way in the onboarding and the adoption phase. How mm-hmm. critical is it 
as a RevOps leader to have a software vendor be that partner? And what are some of the best practices you've maybe seen from those software vendors that really go above and beyond? Yeah, no, 100%. I mean, I think more than ever before, the relationship selling is so critical. I mean, there have been many times where I've, you know, been fit when I'm selecting a technology, you know, as a RevOps leader, Mm -hmm. and I have two technologies in front of me, I've figured out that it's one of these from a feature or, you know, a product perspective, they're fairly equivalent. Um, from mm-hmm. a price perspective, fairly equivalent, or at least you know you can negotiate down or negotiate up. But the relationship with that, um, I guess you wouldn't negotiate up, but negotiate down. <laughs> but if you have, yeah. um, you know, but when you, between the two sellers and then their support team and kind of their customer success team, you know, what the confidence in their ability to work with me to not only implement the product, but also to help me ongoing be successful. That was the decision, right? That's sort of the tipping Mm -hmm. point. You know, although one technology was a little bit, probably a better, slightly better fit, I went with the partner who I felt like, hey, this is truly going to be a partner. Not only are they going to help me be successful and our team be successful, but also um, provide best practices. Right. That's what we want mm-hmm. It's like, how is everyone else doing it? Right. How are my competitors doing this? And, you know, how are they leveraging these tools? So that's incredibly, incredibly important. Um, definitely in the buying cycle and especially for a rev ops, you know, talking about target persona from a rev ops yeah. perspective these folks tend to have a huge backlog of things to do, right? They ha- they're they always, you know, under resourced. They tend to not have enough, you know, time or resources to be able to um, accomplish everything that they need to. So the more they can rely on a vendor that's going to help them be successful quickly and drive value and impact for the business, that's incredibly important. And, you know, there's a lot of different ways we adopt tools and technology, Not not this being that side of things, but I would think, there's there's also a a trend that I've seen, which is a lot of the freemium and a lot of the plugins and a lot of the hey I can go on my computer and add this or add that is like small little applications. I can only imagine that that is like <laughs> dropping you know pieces of trash all around the house for RevOps sometimes. <laughs> like, like I'm coming back behind cleaning all this up and going where is all this or, or we're changing things what's happening. Smaller organizations, I get it. They have to be quick and nimble. I've been on that startup side of kind of that zero to 10. But when you're in a large organization, that changes quite a bit. How do you balance that need for like quick adoption and innovation Mm -hmm. and more of the like, how do I build this into a bigger, repeatable, scalable system? Yeah, I think that's really important. Um, You know, and maybe this is one of the, you know, kind of the superpowers, I think, of a really strong revenue operations leader is that ability Mm -hmm. to keep everybody aligned, right? Keep being an excellent communicator is, you know, that's one of the things I always talk about is, you know, that top that top strength, if you can have nothing else in operations, you want to be a good communicator. And it's not just about, Mm -hmm. you know, writing a good email or doing a good presentation, but it's about the ability to influence, right? Really be able to influence others who you don't have direct authority um, over, but really being able to influence and drive consensus and just bring everybody along for the journey, Mm -hmm. right? And so I think part of that is, being able to have those relationships, making sure that you're a true advocate and you're visible and proactive in communicating. Because when it comes to technology, yeah, it's very easy for a rep to just download something onto their computer and start using it. Or even a firm mm-hmm. marketer, oh, I'm just going to try something. Let's try this out. You know, it's a free trial. Next thing you know, you get all of your other friends and family and everybody else, all the other users on it. And then all of a sudden you have another technology. Um, so I think being, you know, always in the for well, a couple of things. One is always being in the forefront of tech to begin with. So that as a RevOps mm-hmm. professional, you know what's out there first. And you're actually, when, when a rep comes to me, says, I've heard of this really cool tool. It's like, no, I've already looked at that. And this is why, you know, why we're not getting it or why we're getting it later. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Being on top of that and being able, but then also being very proactive and communicating what you are working on and what you are bringing to the table um, and then have a really clear process for users to be to raise um, this new technology to you. And make sure a very defined process that you oversee on how technology comes into your business, because even if it's a small mm-hmm. company and you want to be nimble, but there's still a process. 
right? It may be only a one or two step process versus maybe a 10 step process, but there's still a sure. process. And that's the way that you build scale, but also visibility and just kind of try to maintain the, you know, before it becomes chaos. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, and, and you talk about the soft skill, right? You have to influence. I think the other one is like, you just hit on, you've got to be curious. Like you've got to have a pulse on the market so that you can answer those questions and build trust with your team. So this podcast is all about EQ, right? It's all about the soft skills. We've kind of yeah. unlocked the idea that in, in sales outreach and, and in sales communications, how we connect with somebody, right? We don't usually buy from people we don't like or we don't trust. That's right. Now, internally in an organization, you're a change maker as a RevOps leader. So what are some of those soft skills that are really critical? And then I'll kind of piggyback that with how do you operationalize some of those? Because mm -hmm. everybody says, ah, soft skills, they're they're woo-woo or, or too touchy-feely. <laughs> But there's ways to also bring them down to earth a little bit. Yeah, yeah, 100%. So, tell us a little bit. Yeah, so I definitely think, you know, the first top of mind is obviously that communication side of the house, right? Because mm -hmm. you have to work with so many different personalities, right? And everybody is coming from a different angle in terms of how they think, what they value, right? What's important to them. That, Being able to be mm -hmm. extremely empathetic and really truly understand, you know, put yourself in those other folks' shoes. As a marketer, right? I can come in and say, hey, I know what you're thinking, yeah. what you need, what are your goals, right? What are you trying to achieve? Or from a finance perspective, or even from a legal perspective when we're talking about contracts and governance and security. And so being really empathetic and then being able to quickly understand understand um, where that person is coming from um, and being able to address that is really important. Um, I also think you mentioned change management and I think um, being mm -hmm. um, really having really good change management and even project management skills is really important. Um, for a RevOps leader, right? That change management, helping people understand the why and the kind of the what's in it for them, right? And helping mm -hmm. them understand and being really good at articulating, you know, the, the business problem, but also the solution and the recommendation and then the why, right, is really important. And so we're over communicators, right? We need to continuously um, be able to do that. Um, driving alignment, you know, bringing everybody together is part of kind of that communication piece as well, right? Being able to keep everybody in the same boat is what I always say, because you think mm -hmm. about everybody in their own small boats and kind of everybody's in their own boats on the ocean kind of floating and, you know, maybe rowing towards the same direction. But with revenue operations, you get everybody into the boat, right? Get everyone into the same boat, keep them aligned, aligned in terms of what the strategy is, you know, what are those goals? What are we, you know, how are we going to get there, right? What are the mm -hmm. measurements, keeping everybody informed, and then everybody rowing, you know, together in the same boat, because think about the efficiencies that that unlocks, right, and being able to keep everybody um, aligned. Um, some of the other things I think are really important, obviously, you have all of like the technical skills and the knowledge skills, but you mentioned being curious. And I think that that is mm -hmm. really important. We're naturally asking why, like, why does something work that way? Or why do we do a certain way? Is there a better way? And always be asking, how do we improve this? How do we make this better for the team? Um, and what else would I say? Definitely the curiosity. Um, I definitely think the communication is always top of mind for me. Um, and then I would also say, you know, the change management we touched on. Um, I would also say mm -hmm. that, you know, RevOps folks are um, the type of people the, the ones that are successful that I've seen, they're very, very, um, you know, roll your sleeves up and let's just get this done. They're the folks who are very like accountable as of they take ownership um, yeah. for the things that they're tasked with. Cause a lot of times they don't get the big kudos, right? They're not the sales, you know, salesperson who closes the big deal and gets to go hit the gong. Right. Um, but they're, uh -huh. but they uh -huh. tend to be the ones that are doing all the things in the background and still running the ship, right? That that engine and that infrastructure that we were talking about. Um, so I think that it's really important that they're very accountable. They take ownership for things and they hold themselves personally, you know, responsible um, for getting things done. We always talk about that, like we just get things done. You know, we know how to get, get stuff done. <laughs> yeah. Well, a lot of self-awareness, but a lot of like self-regulation of like being able, yeah. I think in meetings all the time, and and I think of RevOps sits there and I love the, I've worked with some RevOps leaders that just kind of sit quiet, they listen, they take it all in, they hear everybody out. 
Mm-hmm. And then they speak and it's like, you have such a calming effect in a room <laughs> yeah. compared to, no, you can't do that sales. We have to do it this way. Or no, you can't do that marketing. Yeah. We have to have it come through a form this way. It's like, I think you said it. It was like having empathy with each of those people and what mm-hmm. they're trying to accomplish. Because I had a guest on right when we started this podcast and it was Chris Veritas and he does RevOps at, uh, at Paycor. And I liked what he said of, my customer, like who I sell to mm-hmm. is my marketing leader, my, my sales That's leader, right. right? They have to be happy in knowing that I'm serving them and doing the job for them. That's who I work for or, or, or work with, work for, however you want to say it. Yep. And I like that kind of frame of reference because when you go into every meeting thinking that, yep. and it is, it's tough. Like there's a lot of self-awareness and, and, and emotional like understanding to be able to sit back and say, no, it's not about me. It's about them. And I'm going to be here to help. That's, it's not easy to do. I I think of it often. I've been in organizations where we're talking about kind of overlap with tools and, Mm -hmm. you know, sending video notes. That's a great place where there's a lot of people that a lot of different solutions that can do that for you. Right. Right. And so you have a a sales leader that's maybe going off on one side and, and seeing certain tools and certain capabilities. You have certain tools already maybe put into your system that might have some of those capabilities. Mm-hmm. it's hard to be a voice of reason in between discussions like that when somebody's has their mindset on buying something or having a certain capability or tool. Yeah, I think that's where some of this role is a lot of that uh, um, art and science, right? A lot of it is data driven, right? Because we're going to be able to show the facts, right? Here's the facts. This is what we actually have in te- on our tech stack. Here's how we're using it. Here's how we can leverage, you know, partner with you to do that um, versus, mm-hmm. um, you know, there's part of that, but then there's also the the soft skills of being able to actually communicate um, that messaging properly. So it definitely is art and science. I think it's really it's interesting because the ops role, you know, it's it's both strategic and it's very it can be very tactical. You have to be. Uh-huh you know, good with analyzing the data and kind of telling the story, but you also have to be not afraid of going through mounds of data, (laughs) right? So it's a really, Mm -hmm. it's a very interesting personality because it's almost like, you know, they're almost like conflicting type of skills, but you bring all of that together. Um, But yeah, I think when uh, uh, you balancing kind of what the, what your users and your internal customers need, but being able to provide you know, keep kind of the emotions out of it, right? But also mm-hmm, be able mm-hmm. to really get to the facts and help people understand, you know, the data, right? What is the data telling me? And in this case, it's not, you know, it's not data in the sense that we think about from a B2B tech perspective, but more of a, you know, here's the technology that we have, here's how we're using it and kind of be very, um, I think, diligent in terms of providing the black and white facts. And then always mm-hmm. with that eye on, how do I be an advocate for you? How do I serve, you know, and help you? Because it's more of a, here we have the technology, here's your challenge, here's what we can do about it. You know, how do we work together to accomplish what you need to, you know, get done versus, oh no, put a ticket in or <laughs> I can't do that. We have too much on our backlog. I do see a lot of that too, which gives, you know, I think gives operations sort of a bad, a bad name or a bad experience for users mm-hmm. um, versus like, I never, I try never to say no to things. It's always a, you know, yes, when, or well, yes, if, or, you know, there's always a trade off to it, you know, or maybe when we do this or when we can, you know, maybe when, you know, if these things happen, right. And of course the list could be a dozen things, but if these things happen, then we can do that. Yeah. I never really approach things as a, as a no, right. Cause it's very negative and it puts people on that, you know, immediately on kind of that defensive. <laughs> There's a technique this is to good parenting <laughs> advice too. <laughs> exactly. Maybe that's what it is. You know, having been <laughs> a parent for so long, I actually had shared, um, I think a list of 25 things that I think I learned, you know, both as a parent and as a leader that apply to both. Uh-huh. And that is actually one of them about never saying no, because they teach you, right? When you have a kid and they want to jump on the couch or like, you don't say, no, don't jump on the couch. You say, oh, let's go jump over here, right? Mm-hmm. Or they want to have a snack before dinner. You're like, yeah, you can have a snack after you finish your dinner, right? There's a whole communication aspect of it versus saying like, no, you know, it's an EQ thing, as you know. <laughs> It, it, it is. It, it's it's fun to talk about because I think we always think of IQ and the technology and the techno like the technical knowledge of how to put the pieces and parts together. But as you're talking, it's like it's such a more elevated strategic role yeah. and and place in the organization. So for sellers, then 
<laughs> that are getting this all wrong, that are reading the room <laughs> poorly when they're talking to RevOps. Yep. How can a seller better communicate, better engage with somebody like yourself? Yeah. Yeah. So a couple things. Um, and I get asked this question quite a bit, um, mm -hmm. almost, you know, more than what is RevOps or where should RevOps report into and those type of questions that we get a lot. Um, yeah. You know, when I think about selling, it's no different than selling into any other persona, right? Helping those folks understand, you know, what's important to them. Um, you know, how are you going to solve their pain points, right? And how do mm -hmm. you, um, you know, uh, help them say, sell, save some of their pain points or address some of their pain points. But, um, you know, what are those pain points, right? And from a RevOps perspective, they can be very strategic, but they can be very tactical. So a couple mm -hmm. tips for any sales leaders that are sales folks that are listening. Listen up 30 right? minutes into the podcast <laughs> right here. <laughs> yeah, I definitely think that, you know, there's a, there's a couple different facets, right? A couple different ways and angles. And you, have, and you need to know, like any other role, kind of where that RevOps sits, right? If they are mm -hmm. more of the administrator of the systems, you're going to want to talk to them about how you're going to be able to save them time, right? You're going to be able to help drive adoption and, you know, mm -hmm. and how you're going to get those users to use the technology, how you're going to be able to um, primarily save them time in manual work, right? That's more of the tactical side of the house um, and mm -hmm. have them not have to do the things that they really don't want to do right, or don't want to spend time doing. But when you move up and you're talking to more of the leadership and it's a little bit more strategic, helping save them time in the sense of the things that, the tactical work so that they can be more strategic, right? Being able mm -hmm. to focus on the things that position them as a thought leader um, to the rest of the organization versus that administrator. Because if you talk to RevOps leaders, um, especially in sort of that manager, senior manager, director role, one of the biggest um, challenges that they have is being, you know, seen as a thought partner and business leader mm -hmm. versus kind of that order taker or administrator. So if you can provide a technology or a solution that's going to help them up level in the organization by either saving them time on some of that tactical work that they can no longer do so they can focus on the strategic work or providing them with the insights and the information that they need to be able to provide a story, you know, to their CRO and to their executive team to have position them as a thought leader, no longer producing dashboards and reporting, but bringing that story to the to the table and being able to then make recommendations on how to pivot and how to improve. I saw your That's face just really... kind of light up because. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> It, it does because I, I don't think as sellers, we think of this. I think we think of the role and, and I'm talking as a marketer that builds out personas. It's like, you always think of like the, the VP, I, I do this is, so I won't say we, I, I think of the VP of sales as like, that's the person kind of driving the ship and driving the, the, the strategy on the sales organization of how they're going to engage. But mm -hmm there may be more the people person and making sure everybody's successful and, 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 and happy and, and motivated. Mm -hmm. But I think like you're saying, elevating the role of revenue operations and, and giving them that aspirational goal and that, that ability to tell the story and build consensus internally. So what, what are some of those resources? What are some of those questions when you're trying to build consensus that you constantly get from your peers? If you're trying to sell that thought leadership or that, that, that new idea? What are the things that you're asking for from a seller? Like arm me with the right stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, you touched on AI just a little bit um, early on when mm -hmm. we we're talking about technology and, you know, I hear yeah. a lot of conversations around AI, right. And everybody, you know, kind of in the vein of trying to stay ahead of the technology, I take a lot of calls yeah. to see early stage companies and what they're building and to understand what's out in the market, but also to help them to say, Hey, is this even a problem? Right. And who do we, who yeah. do we, um, who would this problem resonate with? Um, but from an ops perspective, when you think about AI, if you can sell technology that can either do something that a human, meaning a RevOps person, takes hours to do, right? There might be analysis yeah. that they want to get to, right? They want those insights, but it's going to take them hours to dump all this data into a, you know, into an Excel file or a Google sheet and pivot and, you know, to their heart's content and be able to kind of figure out all of that information. So if you have a technology that can save that time, so they're not doing that, but now they're actually mm -hmm. seeing the insights.
in, being able to look at the insights, or even better, you're actually bubbling up the things that they should be looking at, right? You have those best practices on what other RevOps leaders care about and what your CRO cares about. Because mm -hmm. I think as a RevOps leaders, as they start to elevate in the organization and in their career, oftentimes they don't know, you know, they're not sure what, sometimes they don't know what those insights are, right? They know all the basic, you know, lagging indicators that we all measure, um, but yeah. not so much of like, what should I be asking? What should I be actually looking for that would be helpful? So if you're a technology vendor or a solutions provider, and you can actually say, this is what you should be caring about, and then not only bubbling up the insights, but then point me to how do I fix those things, right? Where should yeah. I actually be looking? Um, and I think that's where the AI and the tech can really help operations kind of up level themselves because one time saving where they're not doing manual work or analysis, give me the insights, but better than just give me the insights, tell me where I should focus and how do I go about fixing or addressing those things to make them better. Um, then they can be that storyteller, right? And go to the business. Yeah. And now you're going to be speaking the language of more of the mid-management RevOps folks. When you talk about those insights, like what are some leading insights that you've seen coming out recently, especially AI, as we've been able to analyze more data and, and drive more insights from some of that or, or see things that were maybe blind spots in the past? Yeah. What are some of the leading insights that you look for or that you're interested in, in terms of what you've seen recently? Yeah, I think for me, um, you know, people talk about a lot of those lagging indicators, right? They look at win rates and they, you know, and they look at, um, mm -hmm. you know, obviously total revenue close and how many, you know, they do a lot of counts of how many MQLs and how many SQLs, right? And we all like to count how many leads come in, but the real, uh -huh. um, the real importance is not just about con conversion for one. I've been on my soapbox a lot about conversion and not just conversion from MQL to SQL, but you think, you know, from marketing to sales, but also conversion mm -hmm. along the entire funnel, right? Even moving from one stage to the next, moving from a forecast category from, you know, from upside to commit, moving a customer from, you know, a renewal to an expansion and to continue to grow. So incrementally, if you think about across the entire funnel, having insights mm -hmm on what is actually working to move people from one step or stage to another and what how do we move them faster right because we all care about move you know more deals faster right bigger deals faster um so yeah. being able to make those incremental changes versus oh i just want to focus on the big things like top of funnel how many leads are coming in and then how many opportunities we close right i think we look at a lot of those things but think about if you could incrementally improve even 1% or 2% on every mm -hmm. part of the um, journey you're going to end up with, right? The result is going to be hugely impactful. And so I think that's where AI can really come in is analyzing, yeah. helping you understand what made this prospect move, you know, to a certain, you know, fill out a form, for example, right? But what made yeah. them move to the next stage or take a meeting or move, you know, uh, progressively past that point and what what things were different uh, or characteristics are different about that particular prospect or what you did or activity that you uh, provided that helped them move mm -hmm. faster than other deals. Um, I think that's where well, the analysis comes in. It, it makes sense, right? Because it's like going and, and I'll use a sports analogy because I think it's it very re relevant to just sales. We see that all the time, the parallels, mm -hmm. right? So having the X's and O's on the field is one thing, right? Seeing where everybody sits or what happened, but trying to, and I think what you're getting to is trying to understand why it happened, mm -hmm. why that person moved this way or why that did that exactly is a whole nother layer deeper than just counting the bricks, right? Counting the number of things that came in or the number of times you did this activity. It's, it's moving from then quantity to, to quality is what it sounds like. Like, how yeah. do we get those qualitative measures? Yeah, 100%. And I think that's where the technology and the AI comes in, right? Because then it can, yeah. it can analyze, you know, thousands or I don't know, millions of different data points, right? Versus a human uh -huh. cannot do that, at least not in a very succinct way or efficient way. Um, and so that's where I think we can really benefit because that's the learnings, right? And that's kind of where, you know, what RevOps really we want to do is be able to tell mm -hmm. you where to focus, you know, what's working, what's not, and then feed that back into your revenue process to improve things moving forward. So, yeah. I, I love that. I, I take that and, and 
popped in my mind. There was a, at a conference, someone said, you've got to wiggle. And I was like, wiggle, what? You've got to wiggle. <laughs> what does that mean? And it was, what does good look like? Yeah. You got to understand how to wiggle. Like you got to understand to identify what good looks like. Yeah. And, yeah. and I think you're, you're hitting that on the head is like those, those leading insights mm-hmm. where we can go in the future and maybe where rev ops should be, should be focusing. And Hopefully not where every pitch deck for every seller that is listening <laughs> to this podcast goes in the next pitch, but <laughs> towards the qualitative measures, towards towards those leading insights. I, I, I love that. So yeah. we've talked a little bit about AI. We've talked a little bit about what excites you in the future and some of those things and where RevOps is moving. Tell us a little bit about yourself, Roslyn. Tell us, uh, how'd you get into this whole thing? What made you jump into RevOps? What was, you know... Yeah, I'm curious, your background, college, growing up, those things that kind yeah. of spark, spark that interest. Yeah, I think it's really funny because when I talk to people, like none of us really, you know, grew up going, oh, I want to be in operations, right? I want to go yeah. support, you know, whether it's sales or marketing or even post sales, right, support. Um, but I think a lot of times you just have sort of that operational mindset. Um, meaning, Mm -hmm. you know, I describe this to other ops leaders and they get that expression of like, oh yeah, I get it. That makes sense, which I call ops therapy, by the way. Um, But I I always call it ops therapy because when you talk, when an ops leader talks to another ops leader, I'm sure it's the same for marketing and for sales, but when you talk, you talk the same language and you'll say something and they just have this expression of like empathy and just like, I know I've been there. I've done that. I felt that. Um, But I think, you know, we have sort of an operational mindset, meaning that, you know, when we see chaos, like something, you know, really kind of that crazy Mm -hmm. chaos, we're the type of people that want to go closer and we want to figure it out, right? We we're naturally curious, as you mentioned, but also want to be able to make sense of the chaos. And I think if that if that resonates with you, then you're probably you might be a good fit for operations. If you're the ones who are more like, oh my gosh, I don't want to touch that. You know, you step away slowly and kind of back off at mm-hmm. or turn around and run. Then you know, ops, especially in a in a high growth startup, is probably not the right you know the right fit. Leave the dumpster fire to someone else. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm out. I'm out. <laughs> yeah, I'm done. Um, but I think we naturally curious and we want to we want to fix things, right? We want to make sense of the chaos, and then we want to be able to build. You know, as a as mm-hmm. uh, you know, an ops leader, I've been in ops for so long. But even you know, I give you an example. Recently, when I was building my website or building the com- community, yeah. it's such a rewarding and energizing experience to just get your hands on keyboard to go build something. So I think that's where I just naturally gravitated to that because of that kind of more tactical aspect of liking to build and liking to make sense of the chaos, coupled with mm-hmm. my coupled with just the fact that I love to help people. And I think a lot of ops yeah. leaders are naturally that way. They want to enable and support and help people be better at what they're trying to achieve. And that makes it for a really good operations person as well. Maybe that feeds into it's, the parent aspect too. <laughs> I, th- I think it does. Cause it's, right. Like you think of a really good parent and it's like part coach, yeah. part problem solver. Like <laughs> you, you got to let people fall and deal with their things. And like sellers are going to do what sellers are going to do, but then yeah. you've got to kind of also be able to coach and nurture. There's a lot of aspects to that. I, I think it's a good <laughs> parallel and it adds a lot of insight into the persona of RevOps, right? I know there's there's different different you know flavors of RevOps and sales enablement, but it, it really does talk to at the core is the same thing. I, I'm married to a, a teacher. My mom was a teacher. I was just at a sales enablement conference. My takeaway was these people at their core are teachers. They're educators, yeah. right? My takeaway of this conversation is at the core. I've been watching Silo recently. It's like that person that wants to con- like make sure the engine's running, make yeah. sure that whole like system doesn't shut down and that all those people that are relying on that system aren't left without, you know, the things they need. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's a very like, and, and so that's as sellers or as marketers, I think it's so important to get into that mindset when you're going to talk to that person of what they're really going to care about and how they see the world. I, yeah. I just, I think if there's one thing we can all do, it's, it's a little bit more of that. So <laughs> I'll ask you reflect back you're just starting your your journey in, in in technology or you're just starting your journey in finance even better what would you what advice would you give yourself yeah so a couple things but i think most importantly you know top of mind i think is that i would have taken more risks and you know people say yeah. that but i think i would have taken more risks in terms of betting on myself earlier 
and more often. Mm -hmm. um, you know, people say that it's very cliche about, you know, how I don't even know what the saying is, but more about, you know, how you're going to regret the things that you didn't do more than the things that you do. Um, and mm -hmm. so I wish that I had done that earlier, um, that I would just take a bit more risk and go and, you know, maybe get out of my comfort zone more um, to be able to uh, hopefully grow faster, right? I think that's, you know, that would be one. The other thing that I would say is that I wish that I had asked for help more often. And that may be a reason why I'm so um, out there talking about, you know, and giving kind of that help back because I didn't really have that or wasn't able to ask for that in earlier in my career, which I think would have saved me lots of steps, probably <laughs> lots of uh -huh. probably less mistakes made, you know, um, learning from others and maybe accelerated my career faster. Um, and that's what I encourage others to do, especially in the RevOps world, because there's just less of us to begin with. So the more that they can, you know, reach out to other ops leaders who have kind of been in their shoes or are in a position where they want to go, the more that they uh -huh. do that and lean on others to help, you know, grow their own career, I think it'll be, you know, much better for them and faster for them to grow. Well, and, and not to steal from Salesforce, but you truly have been a trailblazer in this profession. And, and that was one of the things that's always sparked my interest is now all the things that you do, and, and we want to get into that in just a second, but from finance to leading revenue operations and really pioneering the the profession and, and that role, you've been a huge advocate for it. So um, it's great to have you on. And, and for those that do want to get in touch, that want to follow you, follow you on your journey, you've created a, a, quite a bit of resource and quite a bit of help for anyone in the RevOps or sales roles. Yeah. Give everybody a little kind of rundown of what you're doing right now and where they can get in touch and all those good things too. Yeah, because yeah, yeah this sure. Is yeah. yeah, absolutely. Happy to do that. Um, so definitely LinkedIn, best place to kind of follow me for content and just, you know, mm -hmm. things that I talk about and love to talk about, obviously, revenue operations, but a lot about go to market. I talk about being a working parent a lot because it is definitely a challenge, um, as, <laughs> especially in this day and age. Um, but do talk about kind of that work life balance and, you know, I don't really believe there's balance, but more of the harmony and things like that. So definitely follow me on LinkedIn. Um, you know, if anybody's interested in learning more about or need some help with, you know, go to market strategy, RevOps consulting, or especially where I'm really focused right now is executive coaching for RevOps professionals. So some of the things that we've been talking about for RevOps as they start to, you know, want to position themselves as that thought leader and, um, business partner in the organization and elevate themselves from a career perspective, but also mm -hmm. be able to figure out a lot of those tactical things and lessons learned and making less mistakes. That's where coaching is very valuable, I think. So happy to help anytime people can, you know, go to my website, book some free time with me if they'd like. They can also follow me on LinkedIn um, and happy to help wherever I can. Rosalind, that's such a generous offer for everyone out there. And I hope that our listeners will take advantage of that and connect with you. Um, this has been so much fun. I have gotten to learn so much about you and so much from you. Thank, thank you. you so much for your time today. Yeah, no, thank you. This has been great. Thank you for giving me a chance to talk about RevOps, which is my favorite topic. <laughs> Always happy to well, chat about it. Absolutely. You have demystified it for all of us. And I think the thing that I learned is not only those leading insights and where this industry is going, but all of the soft skills and all the people skills that are so important when it comes to the process and technology part. Don't forget the people. Yeah. And uh, so thank you for that. Um, to all of our listeners, uh, I hope you enjoyed this episode as much as I did. And uh, catch us wherever you uh, listen to your podcasts. Or if you want to see this and an amazing DJ setup, we know it's her husband's, <laughs> but still, amazing DJ setup. I like... mystify it. Um, maybe one time, Rosalind, on the ones and twos. Um, but uh, anyways, if you want to see this on video, check us out on YouTube as well. Rosalind, thanks again. This Awesome. Been Thank you. Thank you for having me. We hope you enjoyed this episode of B2B EQ. Be sure to rate, subscribe, and follow the podcast for more exciting insights. To learn more about the value of EQ and the technology powering today's conversations, visit us at unifor.com.